sake of time, I'm going to make sure to get started on time. So welcome, everybody. I very much appreciate you taking an hour of your day to uh, come and witness my talk. There are a lot of other great talks as well. Um, really excited for, there's a uh, quite a few that I'm actually excited for, um, for Flock. So yeah, so this is the Universal Blue Talk at Fedora Flock 2024. A little bit about who I am. So I am the project manager and a contributor at Universal Blue. I contribute some code, but I'm, you know, I'm a project manager, so. <laughs> I work at Red Hat, um, so nice connection to Fedora. Um, I love spending time with my family, and I am a big metalhead, so I love music. So I'm gonna start this talk with a thesis, and I just kinda want you to keep it in your head as I go through my talk, which is we are at Universal Blue have the belief that users, they don't want images, they want experiences. And a lot of users will insist that they want images. So just keep that in your mind. I will explain it more as we go. So what is Universal Blue? So we build on Fedora, we are built on OCI container versions of Fedora. And we basically were one of the first projects kind of to test the viability of the model. So we publish base images, which are more opinionated versions of Fedora that have existing tooling and other things that users typically will want. Um, and we publish some main images as well as downstream images, we call them, which are Bazite, Bluefin, and Aurora and Ucore. So Bazite is a gaming distro. That's the idea. It is designed to be used on any PC you want, so handheld as well. And the idea is that you can treat it almost like a console or an appliance in that sense which is really nice, but it is also extensible because it's built on open source. And we have Bluefin, which is designed for the Chromebook normal desktop user use case. And that is a GNOME desktop. And there's also a Bluefin DX as well, which is a developer experience um, image. Then we have Aurora, which is a KDE spin of Bluefin. And then we have Ucore, which is an OCI-based image that is based on CoreOS. And these are for specifically um, the sysadmins in mind. Think of CoreOS as batteries included version of CoreOS. So here is the architecture. It's a little bit overwhelming, but I'll try to go through it. Um, we've tried to make it as accessible as possible. So you'll see here that we have the main images. So those are basically our minimal changes, quality of life, hardware supported images. And we have different things that we utilize that go into those main images. So we have our config repo, which includes configuration files, UDEV rules, automatic updates, and other tooling that we basically copy from a container into our main containers. Then we have a kernel cache as well, which we have several images that have um, different kernels to support different hardware. So Bazite is a great example of that, that there are certain things that it requires to run on a Steam Deck or on a Ally X, for example, which is a brand new device that came out by Asus and other things like that. Then there is our AK Mods repo, which are basically kernel modules, additional hardware support, and those are built against our kernel cache. This helps with immensely with our build process for reliability. Then we have HWE, which are basically hardware enabled versions of our main images. So think NVIDIA drivers, think Asus specific things, like if you have an Asus laptop, 
think about all of the things that you have to do on a typical Fedora system to get it up and running with your hardware. We try to build an image to cater to that. And then finally, this is where you get to the more opinionated changes and specific audiences that we have in mind, which is Bluefin, Bazite, Aurora, et cetera. So we build everything in GitHub, which may be a little unpopular potentially in this audience, but it is a large platform and that's where we've decided to build. And it's where we find our developers. So we use GitHub Actions for basically everything. Um, building our entire containers, building any other things. We're even looking at trying to potentially build our kernels inside of GitHub. So there's a lot of things that we do in GitHub. We also build our ISOs in GitHub too, believe it or not. We have an action that is designed to be able to do that. And I'm very thankful. I, I was actually one of the contributors that worked on this, so, <laughs> so I'm very proud of it. Um, we have fully offline installation ISOs, which was not always the case. Um, we originally, our installations, the way that it worked before was you would have to use an RPM OS tree rebase command from a existing Silverblue installation or Kino White installation, and then you would move to one of our opinionated images. Now that we have ISOs, that's not the case. We can pre-install flat packs, and we can do all of this stuff in GitHub and we publish our ISOs and make them available for users. This is a graph that is not indicative of how many users we have, but it's how many images are being pulled to date. So this is roughly over a year. It's a lot of images. <laughs> we build a lot of images. <laughs> This is just some basic contributor metrics um, for Bluefin and for Bazite showing kind of we are a very busy project. You know, we don't just have like, yes, we have a set of core contributors that have access to the GitHub, you know, organization, but ultimately this is a community effort. And we would not be where we are without the community. And Bazite, again, a very busy project. Um, this is another cool tool that we found called open sauce to dot pizza, which is kind of the craziest name I've ever heard <laughs> for a project, but it's memorable, that's for sure. And it just kind of shows how, you know, what does our contributor distribution look like? You know, for all of our PRs, what's open, what's closed, we're still messing with it, but this is probably for one of the main repos, so. So there are many projects in this space besides us, and we're built on the shoulders of giants. We would not exist without the Fedora community. We, so it is really important to recognize these other projects and how important they are to the ecosystem. So we have some community projects that have actually spun off from us that aren't officially Universal Blue projects such as Secure Blue, Atomic Studio, Blue Build is another project as well, which um, tries to aim to do things a little bit differently than we do. So they decided container files aren't for us. We want to use YAML. That's totally cool. Let's do that. You can still use container files, but ultimately they use recipes and other things like that, and they made the decide to split. And it was a mutually beneficial arrangement. So. And then, like I said, what builds Universal Blue? So we're based off of Atomic Desktops. We're hoping to move to Boot C soon. Um, we're built off of CoreOS. We're talking about the idea of having opinionated versions of CentOS Boot C, Alma Boot C, and then there's the enterprise offering that Red Hat is now offering, which is the image mode for RHEL. So it's a very exciting, it's a very dynamic space right now. So I'm gonna talk about a little bit the advantages of this atomic system and why I feel this is the future of the Linux desktop and potentially the future of Linux itself. So the main thing I want to talk about is how reliable these systems are and why that is so great. So Universal Blue in particular, we keep 90 days of images as images that you can go back to if you need to. 
So the idea of this is essentially, let's say my computer was working great a week ago. And I want to check to see if, well, if that's true. Like, was it working great a week ago? I can go back to that previous image. I can roll back to it. It's a little bit more complicated, but we're trying to create tooling to make this easier. But the best part about this is that you can roll back to the image from the last time you updated. So the idea there is basically, let's say, oh, my computer was working great before I did this update. I'm just going to go into Grub, boot into that, and here we go. Now I'm back to where I was before. I am never afraid to update my computer. That's so great. I leave automatic updates on, which is another thing that we do. We automate updates. The reason for that is because of security. There are numerous vectors and things that people utilize in order to cause you grief. And we are so fortunate to have such a great community that works on security. And if we stay up to date with the software that they're putting out, makes their job a lot easier, makes your life a lot better. So automating those updates, especially for traditional non-power users, is so important. We include drivers in our images. And these are specific images that are designed. So it's not like if you get one that is just the normal image that supports AMD out of the box, then you're going to get NVIDIA drivers. No, you have to pick that specific ISO. But my point is, is that you do not need to think about this when you're doing an install. You pick the NVIDIA version, and you're done. You don't have to worry about it. New NVIDIA driver comes out, cool, we got you. You want to build your own image that has a beta version of the NVIDIA driver? Go ham. Have at it. We build everything on a common cloud infrastructure, which we feel is a very strong advantage. It allows us to shift all the work off of the user, the end user, and put it into the build process. It allows us to rely on tools, modern tools, like Git, Podman, and a registry, which are tools that developers are becoming more familiar with and are proven in the enterprise. And it gives us speed. We can ship a new update in 15 minutes. We've had literally people in our Discord, I love this, where they're like, I have this problem with my computer. I don't know why it's happening. I want to figure this out. And one of our devs is like, oh, that's interesting. I can replicate that. We just literally talk about it. And then it's like, oh, that's easy. I'll just push that in the next update. I'll flip the switch. I'll push an update. Here you go. Here's the new image. Does it work? Yep. We solved your problem. No having to wait. Just we, because of all the processes that we have in place to make sure that you know, the deployment is, is good to go. We can just do that. If the container fails to build, then obviously we're not going to push it, and it won't. That's the point. This is a new thing for us, but we are recommended by framework. We, similar to Fedora, basically, we work on a relationship with them, and we want to be able to provide the reliability of a Chromebook on hardware that we believe is the future, which is framework. Because you're able to modify your laptop in any way you see fit, it's repairable. And we're very strong believers and we wanted to just get this to work out of the box. So similar like you buy a MacBook in the store, this ships to you and it just works. You just install it. We're able to live mitigate upstream regressions. So we can just replace a package that we know is bad, and we can just push that in the image update. Once it's fixed, then we can just remove the regression. Makes it very simple. We can swap kernels, like I talked about before. That is so cool that you're just able to be like, yeah, this kernel works better for my workload or thing that I need to do. So we can utilize our PMOS tree to do that. We are looking at 
having an improved experience for onboarding people to be able to utilize local AI. We have a tool called UJust, which is a tool that is basically just as a task runner, if you're familiar with it, it's kind of similar to Make. But essentially, it's a way in which that you can have a common set of scripts that you use to build and do things. And we just have a UJust command called UJust Olama and UJust Olama Web. So this is like on Bluefin or the DX images. It's not on everything. But the point is, is that we have a common way in which to just get this set up so you can just do it. And the cool thing about UJust is that it's extensible. So you can add your own UJust commands if you so want to for, for any of the processes you have. We have homebrew support. And some people may be like, uh, homebrew. And it's like, but the thing is, is that this is like one of the killer features on an, on an Apple computer. They tout this as being like the thing. They're like, oh, this is great for developers. And we agree, it expands the access to software. It's an excellent on-ramp for users. Increases in availability, and it's a great companion to flat packs which is our primary delivery mechanism for our applications. We utilize Tixis, which is a modern terminal that integrates with DistroBox and Toolbox, which are tools to be able to work with containers. And it's super cool because you can just click in and select a container that you've spun up before and you can spin it up just like this. Like in Bluefin, we have it where it's like, cool, now you're using Ubuntu, and it's very obvious because the background changed. <laughs> you know, and it also supports Quadlets, which is a, a new um, containerization technology that we utilize also for some of our services that we do, like Olama, for example, to be able to spin that up automatically so you don't have to think about it. We have made use of the MOTD, believe it or not, which is, is one of those things that was like, I was like skeptical at first on how cool this would be, but it's actually like one of the coolest features I like because anytime you ask a user to open the terminal, they will get useful information provided to them rather than just a black box. That doesn't tell you anything. <laughs> You can obviously turn this off, but it provides you information about you just. Okay, what's the available commands I have? You know, it provides documentation. It provides, you know, links to our issues and discussion forums. And of course, we call it silly little Unix tricks, but you just is one of the things that we've been praised for because it makes things so simple. One of my favorite UJust commands in that list is device info. I'm asking someone to help me troubleshoot problems that they have. And it's like, okay, I need you to run this command, then I need you to run this command, then I need you to do this. And what's great about device info is we basically take all that information and we just say, okay, spit it out and send it. Send it to the web. So remember when I talked earlier about experiences. So what we found is that people appreciate opinions if they are at least widely held opinions on their systems. And so the developer experience pattern is folks work on Kubernetes. Folks work with VMs. We install that. You need VS Code. Not everybody wants VS Code, but it's there if you need it. Tail scale, very common tool. Homebrew, Docker, Vert Manager. Just basic stuff to get you up and running. Bazite is our gamer experience pattern. So the idea is, is to have a similar experience between desktops, laptops, and a home theater PC, as well as a handheld. To try to keep that experience as unobtrusive as possible and to provide Steam and Lutris support. Basic Linux tools to get things up and running for a gaming system based on Fedora. Wagedroid support, game controller compatibility, 
And we even have custom tools that have been designed by our community and contributors, like HHD, which is just a killer feature. On handhelds, it allows you to be able to customize fan speed, all kinds of stuff. I've barely dug into HHD. It is an awesome project, though. And I highly recommend people take a look at it. And then we have Ucore, which is another audience, which is your sysadmins. Man, I, so for my day job, I am an Ansible technical account manager so I, for Red Hat. So I want to automate stuff. I don't want to have to do stuff over again. Being able to ship a container that already has all of the stuff that I need, like ZFS, NVIDIA drivers, that sort of thing, boy, that makes my life so much easier. And then to not fear updating, that's even better. So those are the types of experiences that I'm talking about that are so important. And why, yes, having a bare bones image is great to be able to build upon, and we provide that as the Ublue project, but we also provide experiences to get people off the ground and to just start working. So I've talked about all these advantages, and it doesn't come without challenges. Everything has trade-offs. This is, in our opinion, the Linux desktop's Docker moment. If everybody remembers what it was like when Docker came out and it flipped everything on its head, <laughs> it's, it's quite the challenge to get people's minds and heads around this system. It's doing runtime, or sorry, it's doing build time versus runtime customization. So you're doing things in CI rather than doing it at the end user. You're using cloud native tooling versus distribution tooling, which is different. You have a container focused development rather than traditional, traditional development. And then you have security to think about as well, which we're trying to solve using SigStore and SBOMs, which are both tools to basically validate your containers. And then there is a list of end user issues as well which are things that we are actively working on, because if there's one thing I, that I try to drive home in this project when I work on it, is that I always try to think about what is the end user wanting? What does the end user need us to do? Large update size is a big problem. Asking someone and seeing a diff that is downloading four to five gigs is a lot for people who don't have fast internet. I wanna make us more accessible to people that may not have the advantages that we do with fast internet. I want better visual feedback during updates. I want to better improve our installation process, and I wanna make the packaging more consistent in the sense of what is it that you're using for each thing that you need to do. So RPMs, flat packs, brew, what's it all for? make it more obvious what you're supposed to do in that situation. Because it can be challenging. It's like if you create a system and you layer everything in the universe, your system is going to grind to a halt. That's why you use flat packs or brew. Last few things are things that everybody in the Fedora community, I think, is at least aware of, which is the idea of having better creative software compatibility and accessibility. Those are both things that I think the Linux desktop needs to do better at. So I pre-recorded a demo because I was not willing to tempt the demo gods today, <laughs> except for my other part of the live demo. So, but um, anyway, this is us and how you would build a custom image based off of Ublue. So we have a template called image template which provides you a basic container file and a build.sh script and some documentation on how to get started. It is as easy as creating a new repository from the template, giving it a description, and then creating it. Once that is completed, where you will end up is, like I said, a brand new repository inside of Git. You have all the information that you need in order to at least start moving forward, and you can just start editing your, editing your container file. 
or you can look it over first, I suppose. But the point remains is that you can base it off of any of our images. So you can base it off of silver blue, you can base it off of Bazite, Bluefin, Ucor, if you like the changes that they've made. I've made my own custom image, which is based on Bazite, because I like the changes in there. And then you can see that there's a GitHub action that is already workflow that has already started running in the background to just build this base image initially. So this should work out of the box. The only thing that won't work is you, and we recommend this immensely, is you need to create a way in which to sign your container, which is documented, very easy to do, and the nice thing is, is it will still build the container even without signing. So if you say, screw it, I don't want to deal with this, that's fine. I wouldn't recommend it, but it's fine. Like, <laughs> the container will still build, and it will still work. You could still rebase to the OS, and you could still start working on it. So then it will push it to the GitHub container registry, which is where we store all of our images. If you want to change any part of this workflow to push it to Quay or any other place, go ham but we decided GitHub is kind of where we do things. So, like I said, you need a cosign key in order to be able to sign your container, in order for it to be a signed container. So, you'll get a very obvious error message that will just say, hey, you need a key. And then, the next section of the demo, I will show that, essentially, there's documentation written out um, by our good friends over at ChainGuard who do amazing container, uncontainer and, or sorry, undistro, distroless containers, and other very cool security things around containers. So, like I said, there's your container signing information. You basically just go and install the cosign CLI tool. It, if you're running Arch for some reason, which is funny if you'd be doing at a at a Fedora conference, but no judgment here. You can install it via Pac-Man, you can install it through Go, you can install it through Brew, you can, you can just download the binary and just use it to create your cosine key. However you want to do it, that is the benefit of, of how this works, is that it's very, very accessible and very simple to do. Yes, so you do need to have a GitHub account, but running all of these workloads, it's completely free as long as it's a public repo. You don't have to pay anything for it, which is great. And you don't have to pay storage fees for the registry either. Like I said, they have 90 days of images, and then once your images are gone, you know, after 90 days, then, you know, you, you won't have that. But, like, it's funny because GitHub isn't even always the best at culling all those things. I've seen images that are, like, 180 days old, and I'm like, what are these doing here? <laughs> so, they're not watching too closely. And you can always store this on a different registry. So, this portion here is basically just me making a basic edit to the container file and showing, like, I'm just doing this in the GitHub web UI because I was... Like, I don't really want to bother downloading the repo and doing all that. Normally, you would use an actual text editor. But my point is, is like, this is how simple it is. It's like, I can make edits to my container file. I can say, okay, I want to install VLC. I want to disable the Podman socket because, sure, I, that's what I feel like doing today. And I just commit it to the main branch. And you can edit all of this stuff in the workflow and say, okay, I, if I make changes to testing, I want you to build a testing image and then I want to see what that looks like before I push it to production. So then you'll see that it built the image. Like I said, I sped past a lot of it because I didn't want to watch it build all over again. And then you'll see, there it is, less than a minute ago it was, it was created. And by default we have tagging that says the date. You could do it by like the actual timestamp of when it was created, if you really want to. So that's how easy it is to get started. And there are other images besides the ones that we publish. Like, you know, the CentOS Boot C, you know, images as well as the RHEL ones if you're in the enterprise. So 
there are other images that you can do this entire process on. So we're not unique in that regard. We just try to make the on-ramp easier. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yes, that, that is definitely a thing, um, and that has happened to me, actually, um, is that I was like, I'm not touching my image for a little while. You will get an email notification telling you this, what's going on. So yes, that is a great point. If you have an active project like we do, it's not even an issue, because we're making commits almost on a regular basis. But I do agree that that is one challenge with GitHub, for sure. Yes? <laughs> OCI, yes. No, no, these are OCI images in the cloud that, you know, you could theoretically download like using Podman, just Podman pull one of our images and you can inspect it and look at it like any normal container. But the idea is, is that this is bootable. So like if I wanted to throw this on a laptop, you know, that's the idea, is that I can use the ISO, which will deploy that OCI payload on there and use our PMOS tree and all of the underlying technology that Silverblue and Atomic Desktops use in order to be able to, yes, to be able to deploy your OS. So, yeah. Any other questions, thoughts, feelings? Yeah, are you talking about like just the general structure, like how we're using a kernel cache or stuff like that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think you're, you're bringing up a very good point about how this space is changing a lot. And like, that is definitely a challenge for sure. You know, we have found that we've had to reconfigure, like I said, like creating a kernel cache was to solve problems that we were having with um, differences in package versions and such that are building against a specific kernel. And because the image changed from upstream, then you know we pulled it down into ours, we found that we needed to start caching some of that stuff, otherwise it would cause problems. A lot of the changes that we make are to solve um, infrastructure problems that we have at that time. And there has not been a lot of churn recently except for some of these smaller changes. And I think, I think that is, you know, you bring up a good point, but I don't think that change is necessarily a bad thing always. I think it needs to be done in a very measured approach. 
and measured way in which that you do it. But I do agree that because this space is so new and we're doing a lot of things that haven't been done before that we are running into roadblocks and things that we trip over ourselves sometimes. And that's just the reality of developing in the open source, you know, I think, is that, you know, it's not always going to be stable, it's not always going to be perfect, but we try our best to try to keep things as stable as we possibly can. So I do appreciate that feedback, though, very much. So, um, so the next thing I'm going to move on is to a community showcase. So I talked about the idea of experiences. I talked about the idea about how it is more important to build experiences than images, which that's a loaded word. <laughs> and I think what's so cool is some of the things that we've had some of our users do, which is they're loading it on everything. We've got people who are super excited about the Ally X and Lenovo Legion Go and other devices. And they're getting our project working on there and helping us do that and engaging with us. And that's what we're trying to do is that like people find our project frustrating sometimes because we do have opinions on things. But it's not like these things can't change. And that's what the community showcase I think shows is the fact that if you want your stuff to look like Unity, then do that. You can. There are tools to do that in GNOME. There are tools to do that in KDE. Like, you can make your desktop look and act the way you want. We're trying to take the crap that you don't want to deal with, which is updating my computer today and, you know, making sure my backups are good and all that stuff, and we're trying to take that crap out of it. We're trying to simplify things. Give it that Chromebook-like experience where I'm not worried about it. One of my favorite pictures, I got hanging TVs with, you know, with a, uh, with a Steam OS like experience which runs on Bazite. Love this picture too. This is one of our contributors, Hikari Knight. He, uh, he's got Bazite on just about everything. <laughs> he's got a Steam Deck, he's got a Lenovo Legion Go in that picture, he's got his laptop, he's got a bunch of modded controllers, he's got the penguins in there. This is one of my favorite ones. So I had an Ansible meetup in, uh, in Minnesota, which is where I'm out of, and thank you. <laughs> and we rented out a space that had a theater available to it. And so my friend, he had a HTPC that had Bazite loaded up on it. So we brought it and plugged it into the home theater and just started playing games after we were done talking about Ansible, of course. The one thing that I've noticed too is that we have been getting a lot of press from people that you normally don't see engaging with Linux. We are getting people that are influencers in specifically in the handheld market that are talking about how great it is to have a SteamOS option on a handheld device instead of Windows. The Ally X does not ship with Linux. Out of the box, it ships Windows 11. It's horrendous. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, it's not designed for that system. It's not designed interface-wise to work for the user in that way. And so the other live demo I'm going to try to do is to try to show you what it looks like to have Bazite running on a Steam Deck OLED. Pray that the demo gods have mercy on me here. Tested this last night and it worked great. All right, here, let me try doing that again. There we are. It's a little, a little weird looking, but I've modified my Steam Deck a little bit so this isn't the stock interface that you would get, 
But as you can see, this is running on underneath Bazite. It is also based on Fedora. Where is that setting? I sorry, having a hard time seeing here. System, that might be where it is. Yep. So as you can see, Bazite from Fedora Kino 40 is running on an OLED. It is one-to-one -one features wise, except it has also additional features that we've built for it. And one of the cooler things that we have as well is we have Fedora KDE 6. SteamOS only ships five currently. So as you can see, once I unify my outputs here, oh, if it decides to play nice here. Well, it's showing it as a second screen, but wake up now. Here, let's see. Oh no, it got very crabby here. Well, that's live demos for you. <laughs> but normally, like I said, you can you can see that it is a, a KDE 6 based. Oh, here it goes. Now it's waking up a little bit. Let's see if I can't get to the settings menu here and drag it over. There we go. So you can see this is just running KDE. KDE Plasma version 6 running Wayland on a Steam Deck OLED. So. And of course, if anyone wants to uh, play more video games on a uh, open source Linux console, this conference, I brought four controllers. So happy to, uh, happy to have a great time there. So let me go ahead and get back to my slide that I was at. And I know I'm running low on time here. I want to obviously leave time for questions. OK. I think this should work. OK. Let's start from that slide. Perfect. OK. So let's take a look into the future. So there is an official initiative that Matthew talked about. Oh, yes, you are correct. Thank you. Such a helpful audience. Thank you so much. <laughs> I will repeat myself. Matthew talked about the idea that Bootsy is an official initiative that is coming to Fedora. So we are so thankful that we can start working on this because Timothy Ravier has been doing the upstream work for us currently and has been publishing images to be able to make what we do possible. Once we have official Fedora images, that will be so wonderful. And I'm super excited. We want to improve the out of the box experience like I talked about. Because this is an experience, right? It's not an image and it's not an OS. We want to fix scaling problems during the installation using Anaconda. We want to, we want to see a on-screen keyboard in the installer so that you can install directly on your device without having to do hacky workarounds like we're currently doing. We want to design tooling that will better introduce people to the operating system so that they understand the differences and how to utilize it in an effective manner. And we want to continue providing good documentation. And that is just a constant struggle that I don't think we'll ever finish. We want to work with upstream more. Bazite uses a custom kernel currently. We would like that to not be the case. We would like our changes to be in the official Fedora kernel so that all of this hardware enablement that we're doing is already just there. And it allows you to also just run base Fedora rather than having to run Bazite. If you don't like our experience, do it differently. We want to provide better hardware support for more devices. M-Series Max is something we're thinking about. Chromebooks is something we're thinking about. The Ultramarine and Fira Labs team is thinking about that as well. And we are so appreciative of the work that they're doing on that. You should definitely go and see their talk on that. Yes. I'm excited to see that one. I saw, I saw it at, a, at the local mini bar conference. It was great. So 
And we're talking about systemd systems extensions, which is another way in which to be able to provide software without having to layer. So for things that require a bit more effort to work that require RPMs, we want to use the tools that are out there that exist. Still very much in beta, still very much new, still working on it. How we are already working with upstream is we're trying to get ZSTD chunked going. ZSTD chunked solves so many problems for us if it is implemented. It makes our images smaller and it makes things a lot easier on us from a diff's perspective. You know, we, that is just a huge thing for us. We would like to see more consumption of cloud native tooling in Fedora. Now I know, what does that mean exactly? I'm not saying you guys need to move to GitHub. What I'm saying is, is that the processes that you guys utilize in the Fedora organization should try to attract developers, the types of developers that we're attracting because of the tooling that we use. And we would love to have more regular syncs, not only with the CoreOS team, but with the Silverblue team, with any of the Atomic Desktops team. We want to work more closely with Fedora because we want to make life better. Rechunk is a tool that I won't dig too heavily into, but it's a new tool that we're messing with, which is designed to lower the image size and avoid unnecessary layer changes. It is hugely helpful and we're already been testing it and some of the preliminary testing we've done, this hasn't hit any of our major branches yet, but as we're looking at it for Bazite because it's the most painful, we're having 40% reduction in the size of our updates, which is huge. 60% if you're updating every day because those changes are minimal at best. We can use, we're hoping to use it in conjunction with ZSTD chunked. And it has a bunch of other options as well. This is what a future architecture should look like or could look like. You know, we're still working through things, but the idea is, is to start using boot C and DNF and Podman with Compose of S as a way to be able to have a more common infrastructure with upstream. We want to focus on the next generation. We are not pursuing traditional Linux users. We want people who haven't used Linux to start using it. We're using Bazite as a way to target the gamers. We're using Aurora and Bluefin as a way to target people who are using Chromebooks. We're using DX to target those cloud native folks as well as developers. So I come back to my original thesis, which is users don't want images, they want experiences. And I hope that coming away from this talk, it helps you kind of think about in that way that images are an overused word and we want, we want people to start using their computers and having it work for them. One unified model of Linux, server, desktop, handheld, cloud. Special thank you to Timothy Ravier, Colin Walters, Mark Russell, all these wonderful teams. And a very special thank you to the Fedora community for allowing us to come out here and do this. I'm so appreciative of all the work that is happening upstream. I'm so excited for the future of Linux. And let's have a great Flock 2024. Thank you very much. If anybody needs the QR code, go ham. <laughs>like we do have some time for questions if um, folks are interested in asking so I didn't know exactly what time it was because my beeper on my on my thing went off and I'm like uh oh I better get out of here so no we're good actually we've got a few more minutes here so about five minutes yeah
Yep. Pretty good. But how about that? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, let's do that. Sorry, could you repeat your question? <laughs> when recovering, when something goes wrong, um, the, uh, the system is taken care of with, with uh, reloading from an older image. Correct. But what about um, installing locally uh, GNOME extensions or Firefox extensions and, and it's yep. like all goes wrong, it's not going to touch that at all. Right. Any, any packages that you layer on top, um, you would likely probably need to look at removing before you were to do a rollback. I'm not 100% sure on that though. You can. Okay. Okay. Yeah. There are lots of people that I could point you at that would tell you the nitty gritty details on that. But yes, you can roll back even if you decide to install local layered packages, you can roll back. Yep. Yeah, and and those that's the type of feedback that we want to hear about is, you know, what can we do to improve that process? We've talked about the idea of even having like a which is something that we're still investigating is Chrome has, Chromebooks have this feature called Power Wash, which is a way in essentially to factory reset your entire computer. So if you do a bunch of things and you're like, oh man, this is brutal and uh, I need to just completely nuke it from orbit and change everything, then you can basically power wash and reset to the image that it was when it started. And I think that type of feature in particular would be super helpful for like vendor um, you know, vendors and stuff like that and something that's just built in to be able to recover. We've also talked about the idea of like recovery images as well, similar to like um, uh, Apple computers or Chromebooks in that way as well. So that basically someone can get back to where they started. But yes, the idea is, is that your home directory is never touched um, when you're doing a rollback, which has both its benefits and its drawbacks, so. So you've described uh, the developer workflow that you guys have been able to build uh, and you know make extensive use of, of GitHub and GitHub Actions. And I agree that that's a really amazing workflow. Uh, but uh, I am still one of those guys who really prefers doing things on his own hardware if I can, just because I know where it's been and so I don't have to worry about what GitHub is doing. What are the options for, for folks like us who want to try to run on our own hardware, build on our own hardware whenever possible? It, are, there, are there efforts to be able to build workflows like this that don't depend on GitHub? Yes. Um, so we have had users in the community that have like Git T as well as like Forgio have like workflow type um, things that you can do with them that are self-hostable and available. The benefit of our system is basically we're not using anything that is specific to GitHub itself. We're using Podman and Builda to be able to build our images. So everything that we're doing is literally just tools that are already available locally. So local development can happen that way as well. There's nothing special that we're doing in GitHub other than using it as a mechanism to automate a lot of the work that we do. So, yeah. Joseph? Um, so, so you mentioned some of the work or, or interest around replicating features from uh, bigger vendors like with Chromebooks and Mac OS and PowerWash. Um, are there other, f especially because you guys have the relationship with the framework and being an officially supported community distro, 
Yep. Are there other features you guys have in mind that are geared toward helping out vendors, making it easier for them? And, and I guess from, from my perspective, like trying to tempt them to want to take this on as their own. So where they're interested in doing, you know, dip, dipping their toe into Linux through a custom image. Yeah, I think um, framework has been huge for us in regards to the support that they have been providing and um, just generally like being being pushed at all is, is just a wonderful thing. And I think it's definitely something that is ongoing conversations in regards to things that we can provide to vendors to make their lives easier. If there is feedback that folks have in regards to those things, or there may be stuff that we're talking about that I'm not aware of um, in regards to that to improve that experience for vendors, you know, feel free to reach out. But yeah, I would have to say I, I probably would have to uh, lean on one of the other team members in Ublue to answer that. So in a more thorough manner. So yeah. Cool. Uh, anybody else? Very good. All right. Well, I am so appreciative. Like I said, thank you for spending an hour with me, uh, listening to me ramble. Uh, so appreciated, and uh, y'all have a good rest of your flock.